Bonjour tout le monde, hello everyone. Je suis extrêmement heureux de vous accueillir aujourd'hui pour uh, une nouvelle conférence virtuelle. I am delighted to welcome you today for a new uh, virtual talk. For those who don't know me, my name is Florian Martin Barreto. I am the University Research Chair in Technology and Society and the Director of the Center for Law, Technology and Society at the University of Ottawa, as well as the Director of the AI and Society Initiative. Today's event launches a new series of virtual talks at the AI and Society Initiative as part of our project on AI for healthy humans and environments, which is supported by the Alex Trebek Forum for Dialogue and co-stewarded by three leading uh, research group at Yorawa, the Center for Law, Technology and Society, the Institute for Science, Society and Policy, and the Center for Health, Law, Policy and Ethics. For today's virtual talk, we have the pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. David Christian Rose, who is the Elizabeth Creek Associate Professor of Agricultural Innovation and Extension at the University of Reading in the United Kingdom. His work explores technology adoption and behavior, behavior change in forming uh, using centered technology design and the social and ethical impact of the fourth agricultural revolution. So today we'll discuss the, the use of robotics uh, in forming and we'll share some of his uh, research finding. And after his talk of about 30 minutes, he will be joined by Dr. Kelly Bronson, Uh, the Canada Research Chair in Science and Society at the University of Ottawa and the co-lead of the Alex Trebek program. Dr. Bradson uh, lead our AI and environment research stream and she will uh, kick off and facilitate the conversation, uh, notably based on the conversation that you will ask in the chat. And without further ado, I will give uh, the floor to Dr. Rose. Okay, so thank you very much for the invitation. Um, if I'd known we should have um, done this in two languages, I'd have invited Juliette, who works with us at uh, Reading, to do a French translation on the side, but you're, it'll be a lot quicker just in English. So I've, thanks very much for the invitation. I've changed the title of the talk a little bit to reflect where we are in this project. So we're only one month into a 30-month project. So this presentation doesn't have an awful lot of user and, and, and work of views of, on autonomous robots in the soft food sector. So apologies that this is a little bit high level, but hopefully it should stimulate um, some good discussion later on. So do feel free to either email me or tweet me. My Twitter handle's up there, um, at D underscore Christian Rose, if you want to talk more or you have any comments on the presentation. So just before I start, um, I, I was thinking this morning that it's about a year since I got to the University of Reading. Uh, it was just me when I started last October, but now there's lots of us. Um, and one of the things, one of the tasks I set some of the PhD students a few months ago was to think of a name for this group. Um, so I said we wanted a catchy name that worked on its own, but also had a good acronym that would be easily distinguishable from any other group that used the same acronym. So I think you'll agree we've done a really good job are coming up with an acronym that no one else has. Um, uh, I, I think they listened maybe to the first part of it, but the CIA um, group, I, I don't want you to get the wrong idea. We're interested in change in agriculture, innovation, how agriculture is changing and the impact of it. We, we're not going to come and investigate uh, what's going on in your um, um, personal or, or um, criminal lives. Uh, but the, thank you very much, particularly to Jess Lyon, who is working with us on this project and has helped with a lot of the slides today. But our group is interested, as I said, in how innovation particularly is changing agriculture, um, the ethics of some of the new agricultural innovations and, and also a bit on the extension side. So just um, for non-UK people in the call, um, a little bit of background on the funding landscape for agritech in the UK. Uh, we, we don't particularly like in our group the phrase agritech because it, it's come to be used to talk about sort of big tech innovations. And I think we're forgetting some of the lower tech innovations and also non-tech innovations that are important to farming. But nevertheless, there is lots of interest, both public and private interest in funding 
the next wave of agri-tech innovations in the UK. So the government recently, two or three years ago, announced a £90 million investment to transform food production. The first phase of those projects were very much devoted uh, towards funding sort of big tech projects like robotics, vertical farming, automation, AI, drones and other things. A recent paper that Hannah Barrett wrote looked at what type of projects had been funded and there was a, an emphasis on the big tech projects. Uh, Innovate UK, who fund um, the Transforming Food Production programme, have started to move now towards a bit more of user involvement. So it's less, it's not just necessarily about developing the technologies, it's also about demonstrating the technologies, evaluating their impact and including the end users in the design and the delivery process. So it's been quite a marked change over the last year or so, this emphasis that the end user needs to be involved in the design of these technologies. And that's where our project fits in. So it's the Robot Highways project that was funded as part of this demonstration call. Uh, it's a collaboration between the University of Reading and the University of Lincoln. It's led by Saga Robotics. Uh, other partners, key partners are, are BT for the, for the telecom side, the Manufacturing Technology Centre, and also Berry Garden, Garden Growers, which is a big um, industry organisation that is a key player in the soft food sector in the UK. Um, and the aim is to demonstrate multiple application technologies for autonomous systems across a single farm. Um, and this single farm, we're gonna demonstrate these auto autonomous technologies is Clockhouse Farm in Kent. So if you're wondering what this project intends to demonstrate, it's not just going to be, for example, just a fruit picking robot. The aim is to demonstrate, and if everything works well, to ultimately uh, implement a scale uh, autonomous technologies um, that work across the different system on the farm. So to do fruit detection and forecasting, disease control, fruit picking, logistic support, pack house integration. So a number of different jobs that normally humans would do on a farm. Uh, there is the aim that autonomous our autonomous robotic technologies can perform all of these roles and these will be tested from next summer and the aim is hopefully that it all works and it's economically beneficial and it's reliable and uh, the aim is that this can be rolled out at scale. Now why is this such oh, so this is just a quick video hopefully it works to show uh, what the robot looks like so this is the actual robot that will be used in the trial. So hopefully that gives you a good idea. So this is the robot by Saga Robotics. Essentially, the um, autonomous bit is, is the base. So the base um, that you saw there was supporting a system to do disease control. Um, we can also attach things to pick the fruit or to help pack the fruit. Um, there's multiple different um, ways that that autonomous robot can actually support what goes on on a soft fruit farm. Um, why this is so needed for the industry at the moment is that the soft fruit industry 
and also other industries like top fruit, apples or field veg, broccoli, even the dairy sector are suffering huge pressures at the moment from the environment and also lack of labour. So obviously you, you all know about the need to move towards net zero and some of the environmental challenges of chemical use, but labour is providing a really immediate threat to the sustainability of this industry. So in the UK, we've got this immediate dual threat of COVID-19, which means that it's, it, it's very difficult to provide safe working conditions for workers on farm. It's very difficult for farms to be accessing the labour needed with, with self-isolation rules and, and um, stopping the flow of migrant labour. We're also hit with uncertainty about Brexit, which potentially reduces access to migrant labour that these growers have been relying on for a number of years. Um, and this problem is immediate and it's unlikely to go away quickly. Uh, a recent survey found that 65% of businesses in Scotland were considering downscaling operations due to the problem of lack of labour. And there appears to be no real solution to this problem except trying to use autonomous robots to replace that labour. If the labour doesn't exist, there is no other solution than using these robots. So that's why this project uh, is being seen as so important, because it potentially provides a solution to this very real problem. Um, a problem that is not just um, confined to the UK. We've seen uh, COVID outbreaks amongst migrant farm workers, farm workers all over the world. So this is generally a challenge that is faced by all growers and farmers around the world and autonomous robots potentially provides a solution to this issue. Now, um, autonomous robots and indeed other smart farming technologies like, like drones or, or gene editing or all sorts of other things, they promise an awful lot. I, I like the phrase that was used in this paper that I put at the bottom of the slide, the promise of precision, because for many precision agricultural technologies, particularly some of the ones that are quite emergent at the moment, it is a promise. They promise an awful lot of things, and not just in the soft food sector, but in lots of sectors of farming. They promise potentially to save labour and offer lifestyle benefits. So robotic milking people tell you that it can free up time for the farmer and it can stop a farmer from having to do hard labour and it improves your lifestyle. Um, it's claimed that some of these technologies might improve animal welfare, they'll increase your profits, they'll reduce chemical use and electrification might help net zero targets. They'll reduce food waste and improve food security if robots can fill the labour gap. That's really important in the soft food sector. If we can't pick the fruit, then the fruit just rots there in the field, which is no good for food, no good for the grower, but no good for people either, particularly when we want to be encouraging them to eat healthier diets. Um, it's promised that tech, there could be more tech jobs in farming, attracting younger workers, potentially providing a bigger gender balance. There's lots of claims of the potential value of these technologies, and I'm sure many of them may well come to pass but most of them are still at the stage of promise. They are not yet tested at scale and the potential benefits of scale to the grower and other stakeholders are, are, are not really proven yet. And alongside these promised benefits, which, which you know, I'm, I'm not a blind uh, techno pessimist here. I really do think there is a role for these technologies um, in the future of farming, particularly in these sectors that are suffering from a lack of labour and there really is no other solution. But I really like this quote from Phoebe Sengers, who was announcing a new project of Cornell. Um, you can read it yourself. But it's inevitable that some people will lose from this technology revolution in farming. Indeed, revolu technology revolutions in all sectors have winners, but they also have losers. That shouldn't mean, of course, that we don't do it. If we never if we never wanted people to lose, we'd never have change in the first place. But it does seem unwise, as, as Senga says, to just assume this is just going to work out, that autonomous robots are suddenly going to replace labour 
and it's going to be a really reliable technology and it's going to benefit growers and benefit consumers and just have all these benefits everywhere. It would seem unwise not to at least think about what some of the challenges of the implementation of these technologies might mean. And there's been lots of work now, not really on autonomous robots in agriculture because they've not been implemented yet. Uh, at scale, they're very much still in the demonstration phase. So there isn't much empirical work at all on the impact of autonomous robots on farms. But there is a burgeoning literature on the impact of different types of smart farming technologies and some of the ethical issues of them. So for those who aren't familiar with this work, I'd, I'd very much recommend the special issue by Lawrence Clerks as a good way to start. There's lots of nice papers in there that discuss some of the ethical challenges of um, smart farming technologies. I spoke to the editor of Precision Agriculture this week about this talk, and he sent me an abstract of a paper that's coming out in the next few days, um, which looks at, gives an overview of some of the ethics of, of robots in agriculture that might be quite nice to look at. But there are potential, lots of potential ethical issues with autonomous robots and other technologies. So I'll just go through them quickly. So one is employment. It might well create jobs, but surely it's also going to replace workers. Um, there's a nice paper by Sarah Rotz, who's um, a Queens, I think, with colleagues from Guelph, that looks at job displacement, because there are many parts of the world, uh, particularly when, when hopefully we get over COVID, where there isn't a shortage of labour. And if you have people that are wanting these jobs, but the robots are replacing them, then those people lose. Uh, there's an awful lot of scholarship on data, privacy and ownership, and this idea of also who benefits. So is it the grower that benefits? Is it the consumer that benefits? Is it the workers that benefit? Or is it the technology company that benefit? Um, a big literature, particularly in the autonomous vehicles space, about safety for farm workers and farmers, and also members of the public who could be accessing farmland and coming across some of these autonomous machines that could run them over. A little bit about cybersecurity, um, a little bit about whether particular types of growers and farmers will benefit more than others. So those farmers who have the time and the skills and the capital to invest in new tech might benefit more than those who aren't able to make that initial investment. Um, a really nice paper in that special issue by Vic et al, which is called The Political Robot, and it looked at what robotic milking has done to the structure of the dairy industry in Norway, found that it, it was leading to fewer, bigger farms, this robotic milking technology. Then there's the question of whether consumers actually like us using this new tech to produce food. That's not guaranteed. And also for those precision livestock technologies, a bit of work saying, well, you promise to improve animal welfare because you can get down to the individual level of an animal and monitor them constantly. But actually, is this ethical? So there are lots of potential ethical issues with the use of autonomous robots in the so soft food sector and elsewhere that we should really be thinking about before we just go ahead blindly with widespread implementation of scale. Because I really do think it will be these things that catch us out. For those who really want autonomous robots adopted quickly, I don't think it will be the reliability of the technology itself that stores progress. I think the technology will begin to get better, probably quite quickly, and the technology itself might be quite good in, in a year, in a few years' time. These ethical issues won't go away and have a real potential to cause controversy and to slow down that adoption and actually potentially not lead to adoption at all. So we really need to be thinking about these issues with as much time and energy as we do with designing a really cool robot or other technology. Um, this is very much what we found in a recent paper that Hannah Barrett wrote, that there are lots of ex potential exciting things coming down the line with Agritech but also a lot of cautionary notes as well. So just for everyone to flag flag up to everybody, there's a special issue um, in Sociologia Ruralis on digitalization, on ethics, on responsible innovation that's led by Simon Fielke. Um, we had the first paper in the special issue, but there's lots more coming out. And it's a really interesting area of scholarship 
as, as more and more people are interested in the potential side effects of these technologies. Because there are controversial precedents, we can all name them, whether that's in farming or outside of farming, examples of where perfectly probably good technologies, scientifically good technologies that will probably be very beneficial to productivity and profitability if they were implemented, but for whatever reason did not resonate well with the public or other stakeholders. Um, and if you look at the EU example, genetic modification, for example, uh, they are not allowed to be used in the EU because as a society, we decided we didn't want them. And I think we decided that because a lot of this, a lot of the GM development was done without the inclusion of people in the design process. And we designed the technology and had it ready to be implemented. And then we decided to ask whether society wanted or not. And we were surprised by the answer. Um, and this could be avoided with much more upstream engagement of people in the design and demonstration of these technologies. Um, so just to reiterate, I'm labouring the point, but this is bound to happen again with autonomous robots or other smart farming technologies if we don't include people of all shapes and sizes in the design and the delivery process. And there is a good way to structure um, how we do that. So there's this idea of responsible innovation that I think many of you will be familiar with. Um, uh, the Stilgo framework, which is one of the ones that's classically used, has four different components. So anticipation, that we should be trying to foresee the consequences of a particular piece of technology, both the foreseen, easily foreseen, and the unforeseen, both positive and negative. So you often hear the sales pitch about how wonderful the technology is going to be, but you want, you know, on to productivity or to the environment, but you very rarely hear about what the consequences to people might be and whether consequences to some people might actually be bad. Then there is inclusion, which is involving citizens and the, the necessary range of stakeholders who are affected by the new technology in the design and implementation of it, and indeed even setting the direction for technology in the first place. Then there is the reflexivity part, which is super important and I think often forgotten. It's one thing including citizens in the design and development of autonom autonomous robots, but if you don't actually listen and you don't actually change the, the design of the robot or what you intend to do based on the feedback, then there's no point doing inclusion in the first place. And then there is responsiveness. So thinking about whether we have the institutional structures that enable us to respond to new knowledge and ideas and have systems in place that, that govern this technology, that regulate this technology and can help us, you know, change tack in response to, to new ideas or if something goes wrong. And I think I'm particularly personally interested in, in, in the inclusion aspect, because I often think we do inclusion very badly. And I'm going to talk a bit more about this later in the talk. And I know it's something that Kelly is particularly interested in and does a lot of really good work on this, this how you substantively include people instead of just tokenistically including them. Because if you have inadequate inclusion, then you can't anticipate all of the consequences and for whom. If you don't have good inclusion, um, if you, as I said, if you don't have good reflexivity, you might as well not include. But if you don't include a wide range of stakeholders in the process, then you don't learn enough lessons from a wide variety of people. So the lessons you learn are also bad. And there's not been that much work done on responsible innovation and how to do it and how to put it into practice for autonomous robots in farming, because this is all very new. Uh, there's rather more work that's been done, for example, in autonomous vehicles um, and also in other sectors. But I think there are things that we can learn from these other sectors and apply them to this particular issue. So there's a range of different ways that we could anticipate the impacts of autonomous robots in farming. So there are some suggestions to do foresight exercises, um, horizon scanning, 
where you would detect early developments and emerging trends and threats and opportunities. There's some nice scenario building techniques where you could ask different stakeholders to either look forward and think about how to get there, or you could build an idea, ideal scenario not limited, um, not based on limitations of the present and work back to discover what steps you need to take to get there. So that's the difference between forecasting and backcasting. There's some really cool techniques that have been used elsewhere. Um, the DeSalvo work actually was with um, autonomous robots um, to try and get stakeholders to imagine what the future looks like. There was an ag tech movie night. We can use science fiction. There are a lot of interesting methods we could use, I think, in addition to just doing a survey to try and get different people to imagine what the future looks like, whether that's a desirable future and how we might get there. Um, because, of course, if we anticipate that the future of autonomous robot in farming causes more problems than it solves, then if you're a modern mature democracy, you might argue that we shouldn't go there. So that's anticipation. Inclusion, now I'm gonna spend a bit more time on this because I, I'm, a, I'm interested in this particularly. I'm sorry there's lots of text on these slides. Uh, you don't need to read it all. But I think that we tend to do inclusion in quite a tokenistic way. And we kind of do a survey of a few people or we do an interview and we ask them a few questions which say, do you want this? Do you like the look of it? And we, almost in this public acceptance lens and we just want them to say yes. And if they don't say yes, we try and find ways to, to, to massage the data to suggest that they are saying yes. Um, there are some interesting things that are being done beyond just questionnaires. So there are a few examples in the literature where there's been some demonstration events, there's been some sort of simulation in the field and observation work. Um, but again, these tend to be very piecemeal, only asking a few different types of people what they think about robots or other technologies and not really doing so in any depth. And as I think we see more autonomous robots being used in farming, it's an opportunity to think about how we include better. Because a piece of work that we've just done, which looks at um, the, the design of a new policy in England, a new agricultural policy after Brexit, looked at how the government were including different stakeholders in the design of that new policy. They said they wanted to include all people that were affected by that policy, but we noticed that it was fairly easy for them to just listen to the same voices, the same innovative farmers, the same big lobbying agricultural organisations. And actually more effort needed to be made to include those voices, the smaller, less innovative farmers, the farm workers, farm advisors, other voices that tend not to be easily heard, uh, those voices that tend not to respond to surveys and interviews or come to a workshop down the village hall, those voices that are vital because their views matter and they might actually be more likely to lose from a particular change, but we make limited effort to substantively include them. So if you haven't, I'd recommend reading the book by Jason Chilvers and Matthew Kearns, who talks about how we need to remake participation to do inclusion better and to think of methods that can engage all type of stakeholders, not just a few innovative growers who might respond to a survey enthusiastically. Because if you just look at the soft food sector, uh, there are, there's more than three key players. Of course there are, there's many different organizations and stakeholders who are important to a soft food farm. But just to identify three here, from growers to workers to consumers, all of whom have a stake in how a farm operates and how the food is produced. But one or even two inclusion methods is not going to capture the range of views needed to say you're being inclusive. We could do a survey for growers asking them what their problems are, where they see the role of autonomous robots, what they would like robots to look like, what some of their concerns were, and, and how, we could, how we could alleviate some of those concerns. But that method is not going to get at the farm workers 
who really do have a stake, obviously, in this whole process because they may well be replaced by these autonomous robots. They're not going to respond to a survey or an interview. There are ethical challenges in accessing and speaking to these workers, not least because many aren't paid particularly highly and they work long hours. So we have to think of other ways to include them. And the same with consumers as well. Some consumers can respond well to an online survey, many others can't. So we've been, we want to do some thinking for this project about other methods of inclusion that are more inclusive. So there's been some work done on citizen juries um, in climate change, for example, in the UK, looking at how if you have a cross section, a representative um, cross section of the population, um, so you don't have particular groups of people dominating. Jason Chilvers does some work looking at how you can map what people are saying on social media without even asking to have asked the question in the first place. Because if you ask somebody a question for their views on something, you're determining what they can and can't say and what they're talking about. But if you map what they're already saying, uh, having their own conversations on social media, you're not closing down that conversation. That might be quite good. Stakeholder workshops and demonstration events are probably very good for growers, a more interactive introduction to autonomous robots and an environment where they're more likely to, to share their thoughts with peers. For workers, there doesn't seem to be any other way, and I'd be very happy to hear your views on this because many of you are more expert than me in this. To include farm workers, I can't see how you can do that without using ethnographic techniques and observations. So potentially looking at how having autonomous robots work alongside them in the field, which will have to be done in the early stages of this technology anyway, this technology will work collaboratively with workers rather than replace them all together at, at the start, looking at how they respond and what some of their views of, of those robots are, and uh, now they can see them in action. But we're really interested in doing better than surveys or interviews. And I think as a community, if we're interested in responsibly innovating agritech, we need to do better than surveys or interviews and think, think about what inclusion actually means. Um, just quickly, how am I for time, Florian? I have, don't have a clock. Can't say anything. I would say it would be good if you could wrap up with okay. the Okay, I'm nearly finished. That's good. Um, so the two other two aspects of responsible innovation, so reflexivity. So once we reach out to stakeholders and ask them what they think, we have to change. Um, otherwise, we might as well not have asked them in the first place. So there are some good examples, and this will be recorded so you can look at these references. There are good examples of where in for autonomous robots in agriculture, and elsewhere, users have been consulted and then robot designers have done something different based on what those users have said. At the moment, of course, that, that tends to be quite piecemeal. So it's making a few design tweaks to the robot. Um, what users could say is they fundamentally oppose the trajectory and being reflexive should mean having the maturity to change direction completely. And lastly, before I wrap up, there is responsiveness. So we need to learn from new knowledge and also learn from sectors outside of agriculture to ensure that we have the structures and the standards that can govern and regulate the use of these technologies. So there are international standards for robots in, in all sectors. There's some examples there. There is evidence that funders have, have evolved their, their view on responsible innovation. So in the UK, both Innovate UK, the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, also the EU Commission for Horizon 2020 have embraced responsible innovation um, because they realize that the ethics of some of these technologies is likely to be the biggest stumbling block and we need to head that off before controversies are created. And there's quite a lot of work being done and I'd recommend this Basu paper that's looking at how we can use regulation but also other policy instruments to either enable or, or prevent adoption of autonomous robots, tax breaks or subsidies, or for those people that might lose out as a result of this, uh, methods to, to retrain them or provide universal basic income or other ways to ensure that they don't lose. 
So that's really all I wanted to say. I hope that's a, a good introduction to responsible innovation for those who haven't seen it. But the aim of this project, as well as demonstrating the technologies on farm, evaluating their impact, particularly their economic effects, we want to develop methodologies to include the views of growers and workers, and then in time, maybe other stakeholders, and ensure that those views are fed into the design and the delivery of this technology, both on this farm and also on other farms. So if anyone has any really good ideas on inclusion, particularly, I'd be very happy to hear from them. So thanks for everyone um, who's involved and particularly Jess for doing some of these slides. Well, thank you so much, David. That was excellent and super on time. So um, both informative and efficient. I, uh, so everyone, I'm Kelly Bronson. I'm, uh, I'm at University of Ottawa um, in a Canada Research Chair position in Science and Society. And as David mentioned, I do a lot of work on, on agricultural technologies. I like your resistance to agritech because I also try to highlight other forms in my work of innovation beyond just the, the, the sort of big sexy innovations, including robotics. Um, so I, I get to start off, I guess, Florian gave me that charge and I'm gonna ask you a question. I, I so, you know, I've thought a bit about um, Canadian agricultural robots and you had the sort of dot case mm -hmm. um, on, on one of your slides. So Dot is a homegrown Canadian robot from the, the Midwest, um, actually manufactured also in large part in Canada. And Dot in lots of ways is meant to answer this problem that we have in Canadian agriculture, just like UK, around labor shortage, mm -hmm. a labor supply issue. Um, but I'm wondering about, I really appreciate, uh, David, your attention the things that trouble you are the same things that trouble me um, around inclusion, right? Doing inclusion well, not just tokenistically, but sub trying to do it substantively. And and I wonder about, you know, if we think about robotics and 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 the sort of problem that robotics is meant to solve. Uh, if we think about not just the solution, but then the sort of um, what the sort of secondary problems that might, might arise from, from the solving that problem, meaning the displacement of workers. Mm -hmm. So in Canada, I would argue that our most exploited agricultural workers are temporary foreign workers. And you mentioned the case of the COVID outbreak this summer among temporary foreign workers in Canada. So this is a group who's, you know, um, exploited in all sorts of ways and legally very vulnerable. Um, and they're likely to be exploited uh, to be displaced, right, um, through through the application of the solution to to agricultural production that is robotics, and so you know if you're thinking about um, consulting the, those people who to, who are to be affected by robotics, you're likely going to consult these workers, right, and and so there's doing there's doing inclusion well, <laughs> which is a well structured inclusive exercise, not just tokenistic, right? Making sure the the feedback is meaningful um, and and can meaning has teeth in policy processes. But there's also doing it ethically, and so I'm going to ask you this really hard question, which is, how do we consult those still small voices that you're mentioning, uh, especially already incredibly vulnerable people? Um, or actors in the food system or at large um, in participatory or inclusive exercises. Do you have any insights on that? Well, thanks for the first. That's a really difficult question. So part of doing this, I think, is actually um, I'm really interested to hear what other people think because I'm not, I'm not an expert on this. So I've been speaking to Kelly and others, you know, for a few weeks about this. <coughs> um, so we've been doing some thinking and we've been digging into some of the literature on it including indigenous communities in research, for example, because you're quite right for these farm workers who have worked very long hours for quite low pay. The last thing they want is me or a research assistant turning up on the farm and asking them questions at the end of a long day that they you know, don't really want to answer or may not feel like they, they really want to give their views because they, you know, they want a job. Um, and, and I don't at the moment have a really clear answer to the question because I I don't know what the ways around it are. So I don't know if I can answer it, but I'd be very happy to hear from other people who feel like they, they could answer it and have worked with 
disadvantaged communities before um, and have some insights about how that might done might be done. I know I, I, it's, I have unfair. So just full disclosure, David and myself, we are connected with the group led by Phoebe Sangers at Cornell who are running a big NSF project on robotics. So we have these three separate projects in three jurisdictions and we're all kind of troubling through this. Um, and looking at uh, Indigenous-led research methodologies and also participatory action research. But yeah, I, that's a really honest answer. And, I'm, and I wanted to ask you that so that you would sort of throw it back to the crowd and see if we could generate some dialogue around that. So I'm going to throw that out to everyone else now, and, um, but also feel free to jump in with additional or other questions. Um, so, so Bita has a question. Oh. <laughs> it's very long. Inclusive design, whether in tech or law, policy in tech development adopts a normative view, right? That if we can address the concerns among outliers, we'll invariably address and meet the needs of those closer to the middle. I appreciate the focus on inclusive consultation and diversified methodologies to do inclusion substantively. My added interest lies in the internal variation of the intersectional identities of those within groups. That's a good point. Who are your migrant temporary foreign workers or your participant applicators? Yeah, that's really good. So how do you appropriately include those at the margins of the margins? I mm -hmm. mean, it's sort of a question about representative sampling or sampling strategies on, on one level, but I know it's obviously a lot richer than that. But that's a good question. David, do you want to take a crack at it? Yeah, I mean, it is a good question. I think one of the things we need to do, um, and one of the things that some of the students in our group are doing who are interested in hearing from a wide range of, of voices about how innovation is changing their lives is to do make sure you do a good stakeholder mapping at the start of a project to really think about who the different stakeholders are that are effective either directly or indirectly so you can be sure to include them in the project somewhere so you're right i i quickly identified three groups on that slide but there are many other groups in the soft food sector like there are many other groups who rely on 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 farming, rural communities, etc. So to do that stakeholder mapping, I think is important at the beginning, um, so you can make sure to include them at some stage. I think that's a really good question. There are really great examples. I'm thinking, Bita, from um, another domain that I research, which is impact assessment. So um, in an impact assessment, you know, there are good examples of traditional use assessments among Indigenous communities where, where um, interesting methodologies like sitting with elders, but also, you know, women's only um, consultations or just like seeking examples of methods that seek out those marginal within the margins, right? Not just going to sort of chief counsel or in this case, you know, with the robotics project, maybe not just going to the most vocal. How did you put it, David? The sort of loudest, right, the sort of usual yeah. suspect um, um, representatives, the leaders, right, of a community, but also seeking out small voices within those communities and those made marginal within. That's a really good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, I, and I'm happy to provide examples too, um, Bita, if you email me. Um, well, I have another question for you. <laughs> It's about the relationship between inclusion and, and political economy, we might call it. Mm -hmm. So one of the issues with robotics that you didn't list on your slide, and it's something I've published on a lot, as you know, I keep harping on it, is this idea that there's an issue with data and the collection of personal data, not just the data ownership and control, but a bias in the data sets being collected. Right. So right now we have a real um, bifurcation in the adoption of digital tools in agriculture, robotics or, you know, tractors that have embedded sensors. They're called precision agricultural equipment. Um, and it's in, in part because of the affordability of the technology, but it's also because industry is really designing these tools. And robotics is a bit of a different case, but for a particular kind of farmer, and it's a, already a resource rich farmer, right? A farmer that has a lot of money, a, a big land base. And so how do we get around that, right? If we're wanting to include and we're wanting to do so upstream, maybe even as things are getting designed or before they're really baked into complex socio-technical systems, how do we incentivize, right, um, that inclusion by, you know, in my mind, in my view, it kind of takes a bit of a shift in the other part of that slide of yours on institutional structure. How do we how do we force corporations to design tools for a wide variety of people? So views are views are important in designing policies and regulation, but what about 
in, in, um, including in design and how do we then get the actors who have money and power in the food system to incorporate those views into design. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a conversation I've had with lots of different people. So I, I had a conversation recently that was someone with someone who was quite pro sort of agriculture 4.0 and these technologies who said, if you make companies feel like they can win big from agriculture and they can make a lot of money, then that will mean that they can help some of the people who lose. And and I had the conversation with, well, since when does that ever happen? Since when, you know, in a, in a capitalist system, does that the winners really compensate the losers? Um, I guess my thoughts when, when I've worked with policymakers about this tend to come more at the downstream stage to think about how you can use policy instruments to incentivize some of those farmers with less innovative and adaptive capacity to have a sort of piece of the pie. So whether that's sort of subsidizing some of the, their tech adoption or providing tax breaks or providing the skill, you know, those kind of things. I haven't done much work that looks at how you sort of bake in forcing companies to design for a wide audience <laughs> in the first place, because that seems to really you know, the, the primary concern for many is obviously making as much money as they can. And if, if they can make as much money as possible just from getting a few innovative people to, to buy their products, then it doesn't matter about others. And, that, and I think it is an important debate in the UK at the moment with, with changes to agricultural policy post-Brexit. There is a school of thought who say that if some of these farms who have relied upon subsidies from the European Union cannot be profitable without the subsidy why should we care why shouldn't we just let them go under and we'll have larger farms and fewer farmers and younger farmers and farmers who can farm in inverted commas properly um, which is an incredibly dangerous ar ar um, argument not least because of the value of small family farms to you know food food production and, and rural communities so I, I do think it's a challenge sorry that was quite a rambly answer no, that's a good answer. And I would say that's a dominant train of thought in Canada, too. There's a great article by Thomas Long and Vincent Block on open innovation and responsible research and innovation in agriculture. And, you know, if we think about tech sector, you know, and, and what Apple has done, for example, like maybe there's hope um, in using some of these methods of open innovation to to move the needle a little bit. OK, so the question is, um, Sometimes we see things as more complex than they actually are. For example, spending a full day with a couple of farm workers, including working on the farm, would do the job. This would permit you to understand their jobs, their interests, their struggles. It will enable to trust an element in which will turn in, uh, in turn enable transparency and turn enable us to hear the truths that go repeatedly unheard. Yeah, well, thanks. Yeah, so yeah, so those kind of ethnographic type methods, I, I think would be absolutely key. Um, it's not something you can do with an interview or a survey or something that is, is you know, very quick and dirty and then you leave. Are there any other questions for David? Um, so Bita is asking, what attention is being given to intellectual property rights around automation? As things are automated, the traditional boundary between property and intellectual property are obviated, generating greater relationships for dependency. What role can education play as part of the consultation process? That's a really good question. Mm -hmm. No, that is a question. Um, so I, I really like there was a paper by Leanne Wiseman in that special issue that that Lawrence Clerks organised, which was which maybe is not intellectual property rights as such, but it was about data ownership and and farmers understanding their rights and what happened to their data and what they owned and what they didn't own. And they did a survey, I think she did a survey with a thousand Australian farmers, and and they were really high percentages, like 70, 80 percent plus of farmers who just didn't understand anything about their their property intellectual property rights or their data or what was done with it or what their rights were and so I, I think education could play a really key role um, and I do think from some conversations I've had recently with some farmers I do think some farmers are waking up to the fact that a lot of the data collection that goes on might not solely be or even primarily be for the benefit of the individual farmer so they're looking around at all these things in the cab of a john deere tractor or any other organized big organization um, and thinking actually am i getting the benefit from this or are is john deere or others aggregating all this data and using it to know how much wheat that's going to be 
and et cetera, et cetera. And farmers are beginning to think, hang on a minute, you know, I'm not benefiting from this. So, but for many, it, it, that understanding rights and, and data ownership is, is a challenge. So I think education could be a key part of it. In my interviews with farmers in Canada, they're um, quite suspicious that, uh, about government oversight. <laughs> and then and then at least three years ago, weren't quite a little bit suspicious about um, corporate use and misuse of farm level data, but not as suspicious, which is interesting. But our farmers aren't unique, right? Most of us don't read licensing agreements all that carefully. Um, yeah. Yeah. And the right to repair movement is such a really interesting. Yeah. Check out ifixit.org. But maybe that's what you're alluding to. Beat yeah, that, the paper that Hannah Barrett did and that there's other papers that right to repair was talked about quite a lot that, you know, they're just really dependent on these companies to come and fix things or or to to for them for the latest upgrade. And they're really just baked into having to rely mm -hmm. on for everything then. Because of their intellectual property regime yeah. and licensing structure. Okay, one more question, Salma, and then we'll stop. Europe's um, experience with GMO was a great example, building a good foundation of trust on the why we are engaging. The various stakeholders will be crucial, especially that some of the resistance for robotics is linked to potential crop modification, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. No, I absolutely. I don't think it's a question. It's a really useful comment, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, I think David, you come to your interest in smart farming or digital farming from an interest in GMOs and GMO enga public engagements, and I'm the same, right? Because if you look at lots of things, the intellectual property structure, the all sorts of elements of the technology are very similar um, in their their potential social consequences, concentration of power, etc. So that's a really good point, Salma. So Florian, are we? A, this is this a wrap? Do you want to come back on? Yeah, I can. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's a. Uh perfectly on time uh, to wrap up uh, 1 p.m. Uh, our time. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, David, for being uh, with us today and sharing the, your research and Kelly uh, for facilitating the, the conversation and everybody for joining us uh, today. Uh, so on that note, um, I will uh, thank everybody and invite you to come to our uh, next event Next week, uh, mercredi prochain, uh, we will host uh, a conversation about the blind spots in the technological response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So, je vous invite à nous rejoindre mercredi prochain à midi encore une fois pour une conversation sur les angles morts des réponses technologiques à la pandémie de la COVID-19. Uh, once again, thank you everybody for being with us today and have a lovely rest of the day. Bye-bye. Thank and you. And thank you again, David. Thank you, Philemon.